to it. All right. Well, how are we doing today? Everybody all right? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Hey, we got a lot going on today, and we're excited that you're here with us. And I just want to uh, give you a couple things as a heads up so that you're aware. If you are not ready, be ready, because right after this service, we have family day. What does that mean? That means you get to go get whatever food you want. Uh, come back. We'll have tables set up all over here because we want you to have a place to sit and eat. But we are going to have volleyball. We are going to have basketball. We are going to have bingo. We're going to have bunko. There's some prizes, I think, attached to some of that. Uh, there's going to be inside. There's going to be outside. If you like 100 degrees, forget about it. Don't worry. We got AC on the inside. We got game room. We got stuff going on in here. If you are competitive, you bring it right here because I am competitive and I want to play and win and I don't like to lose. So if you want to see your pastor get upset, beat them, okay? And that will, I'll be upset and I'll, I'll be green, you know, just angry for the rest of the day. But look, uh, I, it's a time to get together and to spend as family. And we're so we're excited to do that, uh, especially if you are kind of new to the church and you're like, man, we're new, but we want to get to know some people. This is the best time because we'll be all together. Uh, there's a service before this full of people that like you have never maybe seen before, but you get to see today. Uh, believe it or not, there are other people in the church besides you. So uh, this this is the opportunity to mix in, get to know each other, have a great time. So, uh, you know, maybe you're like, oh, I didn't know. Don't worry. We'll be here for a long time. Run home, grab some clothes, get some food, come on back up. Uh, if you have everything, you don't have to go nowhere. You just stay right here. We're going to have a great time. I promise you, you'll enjoy it. And so that's happening today. But also, uh, it's a very, very special week because once a month we take time to honor our ministries. And so this is Appreciation Sunday. The ministry that we're appreciating is one of the best ones. Why? Because they are responsible for making sure that you don't have to have your kids rolling around in the seats next to you. Okay, they're the ones that free you up to come in here and enjoy service and concentrate and, you know, just build on your relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you don't mind, help me welcome out our kids ministry. All right. And they're going to be coming all out. This is Dom and Faith and Addie and Evie and Maddie and Tracy and Iris and Rebecca and uh, Terry and uh, Crispin. That's it? Okay. Um, so right now you should be asking, well, then who's watching my kid right now? Don't worry. We got it covered, okay? And down at the end is Hunter. Hunter is our youth pastor, but he also oversees our kids' ministry. And this group is wonderful. It's mixed up of adults and children, and they kind of help out in different areas. Uh, one of our bravest souls is Terry. She uh, operates in the lounge during first service so that uh, the people that volunteer around here have a place to take their kids so that uh, they can, you know, serve you. And she sits there and she's outnumbered, but she, she holds it strong, okay? Uh, uh, we have our kids ministry people kind of all through here, but then Iris teaches the preschool and the kindergarten before they get to the kids age group. And so she does a wonderful job. And then uh, Hunter will tell you a little bit more about the ministry. So go ahead, Hunter. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. You probably don't recognize most of us because, like Pastor Justin said, we are the ones doing the really, the really hard, heavy, hitting ministry on Sunday mornings. We're in there with the children. Okay, there's a couple of people that care about that. Hallelujah. Um, I, I, I know it sounds like I'm joking, but I genuinely cannot give enough praise to this team. And there's a couple, a couple other kids in here. Alicia and Melanie are both uh, volunteers. Um, but I just, I cannot praise this team enough because we literally would not be able to function on Sundays without having this team uh, up here. The last three weeks I've been out on Sundays and um, it is the biggest blessing in the world to be able to say, all right guys, I'll see you in a month and then just see them in a month and nobody's dead. Nobody has uh, complained that I know of. Um, I need to check my emails. <laughs> um, but not only have they maintained, but this ministry thrives under this leadership and under this team. And if you are people that like to celebrate, you should celebrate them now. Yay! <laughs> because they are incredible. Um, I, I, I joke all the time. It's not even a joke. I say all the time how these leaders are the holy saints of God because we, whenever we need any kind of 
help with uh, kids ministry, child care, we can call on any of these leaders, and they are happy to help. If you don't know, um, I almost said Shine Kids. That's never happened before. <laughs> Restoration Kids meets in the youth room every Sunday morning, and um, it's, it's from grades first through fifth grade, and Miss Iris teaches our pre-K and K, and we have a great service every Sunday where we uh, go through the entire Bible, and every message points back to Jesus, um, and so we're doing worship, we're playing games, we're having fun, and we are just so blessed to be able to uh, teach your kids and lead your kids, and, and because of the faithfulness of this team, we've been able to increase. We have seen such growth since we've been here. Our kids' ministry uh, grew by like quadruple percent. Is that a mathematical term? When we came here, we had like three kids in kids ministry, and now we have like 20. Um, very good. That's right. And so um, we really, I, I can't take time to appreciate all of you because I don't want to cry. <laughs> um, it's going to happen. <laughs> but um, just genuinely, I want to thank each of you for your support for this team, and I just cannot appreciate you guys enough um, as we've got uh, summer coming up, we've got VBS coming up, we've got a lot of exciting things. That's right. I see that hand. Um, we are always looking for more help. We need you, and you, and you, and you. I don't know how I pointed that, but come see me after service. Um, <laughs> But just one more time, we really wouldn't be able to do this without them and the countless hours that they pour into these kids. So could you just help me appreciate them one more time this morning? Thank you all. All right. Wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, it is always a blessing to have people that love kids. And as he was saying, if you are looking at that and you something that you want to get involved with, uh, there's always room. I know they have a big team, but every one of them will tell you that there's room for you, that there's always a need for help. And so if you love kids and you want to be a part of that, uh, you can find Pastor David or you can find Pastor Hunter and they will help you get connected in and you can join that team. And that is a wonderful thing. So, hey, let's get started so that we can get to family day. I'm ready to eat. My stomach was growling like an hour ago. So let's do this. OK, uh, I hope you're ready to enjoy today because we have a lot of great things. And this is our fourth week in this series. And it's been a good series because we're diving into uh, what it is to share the gospel with somebody. And sometimes we we uh, confuse it with something that has to be difficult, that, that, that takes a lot of effort, and it really actually doesn't. It's more about living your life correctly, and it's more about experiencing and capitalizing on the things that come your way. And so uh, we've seen things like, you know, the Jesus in us makes people curious. Uh, when you have Jesus shining through and people don't see you, but they see Jesus, they, are, they get curious because Jesus is something to be curious about because it's different than the world. And so they, they see the world and then they see the Jesus in you and they're going, why is, why is this different? And so we want to create this curiosity within people, but we don't want to leave them curious. The worst thing in the world to do would be just to leave them in their questions. And so it's up to us as Christians when people express curiosity to capitalize on it. How do we capitalize on the curiosity? We answer the questions. you got to be ready and knowledgeable enough to share uh, why you have hope in Jesus Christ. You, not necessarily everything about your faith, but your hope of why you trust in Jesus Christ. And then you also have to be willing and ready to give your testimony. And you can do it. I promise you it sounds scary, but you can do it. It's possible. And so you're, you're, you're taking them deeper through this. And last week, Pastor David did a good job of talking about, you know, seeing is believing. And when they see it work in you, they'll believe it can help them as well. And so we have to show Christ in us by the way that we live our lives. And so they have to see love and mercy and grace actively moving and working inside of us. Because if we're not showing Jesus through us, then they're not going to see anything that's different than the world. You're the way that they're going to know that God loves them. They're not automatically going to compute God's love, but then when they see it in you, they're going to know that there is a God that loves them because you love them. Today, we're going to look at the circle of influence. And some of y'all are like already tripping out like, what do you mean influence? And my hope really today is to remove any doubt or unbelief that you have the power of influence in your life. You are an influential person. 
And some of y'all may be thinking right now, like, I have nothing to offer. I'm not that, that unique of a person or, or that you're not worth listening to. And a lot of us struggle with, with these kind of thoughts because we don't understand our worth or significance, so we don't try to reach out to people. If I am inside of myself think like I have nothing to give or I'm not worth listening to, then I'm never going to reach out to anybody. I'm never going to try to to help somebody because we suffer from something inside of us. We don't think that we can be effective because we don't have a large crowd following us around like Jesus did. Or we don't have the masses to preach to. Or I'm not up on a stage. Or I don't have a title. But what I want to tell you and I want to share with you this morning is that you are very valuable. And that you're more influential than you'll ever imagine. You will have a, a message to some people that they've never heard before. And so we don't think that we have a bunch to offer. But the reality is we do. And the reason why we don't is because sometimes we look at ourselves through the lens of the world. And it's the, the way that the world defines value that gives us these thoughts. They define value through things like how many people are, are following me on Instagram, right? How many people shared my post? How many people liked my tweet? Or, or how many people, you know, come to me and, and, and have a title for me or want to lift me up. And that's how the world views value. But here's the thing. As Christians and as followers of Christ, our value does not come from the world. Matter of fact, it doesn't even come from people. Our value is found in God alone. And I, I want to share how this happens. And so I want to uh, share a verse with you and, and I, I'll, I'll express a little bit of my uncomfortableness with this verse and it says uh, Matthew 10 31 says this so don't be afraid you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows and that should make you feel comfortable right you're like a whole flock of sparrows you're more valuable than that and, and I don't even like birds you know what I mean I'm like I can't even walk out the front door because there's a nest up there and one of them swooped at me so I gotta go all the way around the building because they come after me and so I want to explain this verse a little bit to you so that you can understand why you're more valuable than a flock of sparrows should mean something to you. See, during the time of Jesus, they would sell sparrows, and it was like the cheapest thing to buy. And already you're going like, well, now you're calling me cheap? No, I'm not calling you cheap. But the, the birds themselves were very inexpensive. Matter of fact, it was a tenth of the coin that was basically given to you for like a day's wage. It was really cheap to buy and they would use it for different things. And, and so Jesus is out there and he's going, look, you're more valuable than these birds. And you're going, well, thanks, Jesus. And he goes, no, no, you're not understanding. The value of a human is so much more than these birds. And, and, and a matter of fact, you would have to take lots of them, flocks and flocks of sparrows. You'd have to gather them together to even come close to the value of a human being. And so it's like, okay, I get it. They're, 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 they're cheap birds. They're not very valuable. I get it. And he goes, but God takes care of every need for this animal that's not worth much. How much more does he care and love you? If he takes care of the sparrow, he will take care of all of your needs. And so now we see that, that there's worth and love and, and so much value in human beings. And so if you've ever felt like you're not valued in the world, it doesn't matter because God values you. Matter of fact, on a whole different level, the, the, the thing about God is he couldn't even imagine or he couldn't comprehend having a, a time or a space where he couldn't be in relationship with you. Because he values you so much, he couldn't allow there to be separation. And so he sent his own son down well, as a ransom for you and a ransom for me. Let me tell you, you don't send your son down to die for someone that doesn't have value, that isn't worth it. And so God is saying, look, you are very much worth it to me that I sent my son down. And if you have ever thought less of yourself, if you have ever had thoughts of, I, I, it doesn't matter if I'm here or I'm not here or if I have value, nobody listens to me. Let me tell you, you have such worth in your life that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And he didn't do it for no reason, but for someone that he cared and loved so much. And so you are valued today. 
when we share Jesus Christ with others, we will never fully know the impact of what we have shared, what it will have. You may think like, oh, I'm just helping one person. But it may go way beyond that person and you never had the intention for that to happen. Our influence on people is greater than we can almost comprehend. Greater than we can know. And we, we may reach people that you never get to meet, that you may never even know you reached. And it's, it's funny because science has actually tried to explain this. There is a theory out there. I don't think they fully have proven it. But there's a theory out there that says that you are connected to anyone on earth through seven people. What does that mean? That means, uh, for me, I'm a soccer player. My favorite player is Kevin DeBruyne, right? He lives in England. Never met the guy, but it only takes me seven people to meet Kevin DeBruyne. Who's yours? You want Messi? You want Ronaldo? Who you want? We're all going to be soccer players, though, because that's our sport, right? And so it doesn't matter who you're trying to reach. You can reach them through seven people. What does that mean? When you share your testimony, your testimony can end up on the other side of the world through seven people. You'll never know. You'll never see it. You'll never meet them. But that doesn't mean that what you say and what you share doesn't have an influence throughout the world. You never know what your testimony will do. There's people that will tell you, and, and there's some witnesses here that I even know have had this happen. Tragedy has come into their life. And as the tragedy comes in, they stand firm in their faith in God. God pulls them through. And through the testimony of what's happened to them, it just explodes through like social media and to people. And people they don't even know are coming to them and going, thank you so much for sharing your story. It helped me so much. And you have an impact on people you've never met. You just don't know the influence you'd have. But I want you to also understand that it doesn't take you going out and preaching to the masses. Your influence can start with one person. You can impact the world through one person. This means when you share Jesus, you can change the world. And I know that sounds really simplified, but let's just look at what Jesus did. Jesus' message and influence works right through our story. And so we'll, we'll pick up our, our story in Matthew 10, 31, and it says... Uh, basically, they're out there, they're fishing, right? And Peter has gone out and they cast out the net, just like Jesus says, and they start pulling it in. We pick up in verse 7. This is Luke 5, 7. It says, a, a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Jesus didn't go out to reach a bunch of people. Jesus got in the boat with Peter to show Peter something. What was he trying to show Peter? He was trying to show Peter, look, when you're with me and I'm moving in your life, the things that you have failed at, the things where you haven't found success, the things that are impossible to you become possible with me. And so he takes them out and they're, they're fishing. And Peter's like, I don't know why I'm doing this because I've been fishing all night and there's no fish out here. And he goes, but because you say, he throws the nets out. And now the nets are so full that they're breaking. They're so full and it's going into the boat. The boat's sinking. He's got to call friends over. Their friends come, and now they're being blessed. They don't know what's going on. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't haven't heard all the messages, but they just know that there's fish going in their boat, and now they're sinking too. What does that mean? That means when you have Jesus moving and operating your life, not only is your life so blessed to sink in your boat, you're going to sink your friend's boat too. The people in your life are going to be blessed because of what you do. When you have Jesus operating and moving, there's no telling the effect it will have. But Peter just goes, look, I gotta call somebody and I gotta I gotta get help in what's happening. And so he calls people over and people are are seeing the miracle of Jesus. They don't understand everything. They don't know the story of what's happened. All they know is this dude is pulling in fish and it's sinking his boat, and we're blessed and it's just overrunning. But seeing sometimes creates faith in us to do things. See, what happens in our life does not stay in our life. When God does miracles, you can't keep that to yourself. you got to share it. you got to let it go. And people are going to take that and they're going to share it with others. And it's going to go on and on and on. And you don't know the impact you're going to have by living your life according to Jesus. What Jesus was doing for Peter that morning didn't just bless Peter, but it blessed the people in his boat. But it also blessed the people in the next boat. 
And now all the people are going to go back in. Who knows who got free fish that day? When you got so many fish, you just give fish away. If we were all millionaires, we'd all be generous, right? Who wants some money? You know what I mean? We'd just be giving it away. It's blessed. It's blessed to be with Jesus. Once again, I don't want to overcomplicate things for us. I don't want you to get this, this thought in your mind that evangelism and sharing the gospel has to be overcomplicated. That you have to be out on the street with a soapbox shouting out through a megaphone. And, you know, I don't want you to think that. I don't, I don't want you to think that you have to be in front of masses or that you have to have a title or a stage or a service or anything to share Jesus with somebody. Can, can you just share with one person? Can you just focus in on, on someone in your life? Maybe it's a family member that needs Jesus. Maybe it's a, a friend, a co-worker that needs Jesus. Is there somebody, a neighbor? Is there somebody in your life that you can look at them and go, I know you need Jesus in your life. Can you just help one person? And when you invest on one person, when you help one person, the return from helping them is always going to be greater than you ever thought it could be. Why? Because you can't outdo Jesus. And when you give your time, when you give your time and your energy and, and, and your efforts to, to bless somebody, he is always going to reward you more than what you have ever given. And it's going to be worth it to you. I have never met somebody that has served Jesus and come back and gone like, oh, that wasn't worth it. I, I wish I wouldn't have done that. No, when you serve Jesus and when you are used as a vessel, when you touch lives, I don't care if it costs you a ton You'll, at the end, you'll still be sitting there going, it was worth it. It cost me, but it was worth it. I would do it again. Why? Because Jesus takes care of his people. He takes care of his people. And so you'll get a return on that. I want to just give you three keys. We're going to go through a couple stories. I want to give you three keys that will help you to develop how to use your influence for the kingdom. And it's not something that you have to like practice. You could do it today. And I want to empower you this morning just to, just to be able to, to help one person. And see how far that influence goes. And so here's just three quick key things. The first one, you have to be willing to reach out and touch someone's life. you got to be willing to do it. you got to be past everything and just go, look, I'm willing to help somebody. Because if you are not willing to help somebody, you will have no influence. You will not change the kingdom. You will not have an impact on the kingdom. But the willingness to help somebody changes everything. And so let's just see what Jesus says. This is Matthew 8, 1 through 4. And I'm just going to kind of share the story. If you watch your Bible, you want to open it up, go for it. But I'll just share it with you. And I'm, I'm a good storyteller. So just stick with me here. Jesus is always walking around. And for some reason, he's always got a huge crowd with him. And he's just walking and this crowd is following him. And, and he's coming down the mountainside. But Jesus isn't worried about the crowd. Jesus is, is going to narrow in on one person. Jesus always had a crowd, but he was never too busy for the one. He taught the whole crowd, but most of his miracles were on an individual basis. And so he knew the importance of one. And so suddenly, as this crowd is following him, he's walking around. I mean, he's got places to go and things to do. This is a big, important man. And so he's walking through, and suddenly a, a man with leprosy approached him. That's a no-no. You don't go towards anybody with leprosy. You are banned from society. You're on the outskirts. You don't have family. You don't have nothing. You have leprosy, and you are an outcast. And so this man breaks the rules and comes to Jesus, and he kneels down before him. He says, Lord, if you are willing, if you're willing to do something for me, will you heal me and make me clean? Now, I, I, I just want to get this because sometimes we don't, do what Jesus does. Jesus is always willing. He is always willing. And it's irritating because Jesus is just always willing, right? And it puts pressure on us to always be willing because Jesus does the right thing all the time. And so, of course, what does he say? Yes, I'm willing. I, I, I'm, I'm willing. And he just says, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappears off this guy. And he tells Jesus, tell, don't tell nobody about this. Let me tell you what didn't happen. 
That dude told everybody about it, right? They, I mean, who's going to, like, you just got healed from a life-ending disease that has separated you from all society. You don't just walk back in the house and be like, oh, I'm back. And they go, what happened? Nothing. <laughs> can't tell you. You know, I mean, you, you can't even go get clean from the high priest without telling them what happened. And so Jesus tells them something he knows isn't going to happen. He goes, don't tell anybody what happened here. Instead, go to the priest and get examined. And that dude's shouting it from the mountaintops. Right? This guy came down and he just spoke and he cleansed me. But it was just the one. Let me tell you, when you're willing to help one, there's, there's no understanding or, or knowledge of how many people they're going to tell about what happened. Or express the miracles or the testimony from, from the one. And so he goes down and he's, he's declared clean. But because of this man's condition, and I want you to capture this right just for a moment. Because of this man's condition, no one probably before Jesus ever even thought of helping him. Everybody just walked right by that person. It wouldn't matter what he cried out, what he said, what he would do. That man was not worth helping. And Jesus did what nobody else would do. And so here, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves as, as Christians. Who are we willing to help? Who are you willing to, to reach out to and, and touch their life? There's people out there that most won't help. But we can't be that way. And so that leads me to the next question. What qualifies someone worth being helped. Do I, do I only help Carol out because Carol is here on a Sunday morning and she supports the church and believes the way that I believe? Does that qualify her being worthy of help? Or what does the, the person at the corner asking for money have to do to qualify for us to be willing to help them? Or your neighbor or your coworker, or the sinner or the other person? What what qualifies them for your love because Jesus had no pre-qualifications for his willingness and he walked up past the crowds to get to the one that nobody would touch that nobody would help and he was willing to do something that probably no one else was willing to do and so if we are going to take on the image and likeness, the nature of Jesus Christ. We were saved, but now we are being transformed into His image and likeness. If we're going to claim that, then we have to have the willingness to do what He does. If we're going to influence the world the way Jesus influenced the world, then we have to be willing to touch the untouchable. It's just simple as that. I know what you're thinking. Well, if I could just heal somebody, everybody would listen to me. It's easy to have an influence in a crowd when you can heal somebody, right? That's what I'm talking about. I want to go up and walk up and just touch somebody and they'd be healed. That would be amazing. Everybody would follow me. I would have crowds and influence and everything. I just need to heal somebody. You're right. You don't have the power to heal. But the God that lives inside of you absolutely does. I'm just trying to be honest with you. you. You on your own, you cannot heal anybody. But I believe with all my heart that each one of us, if you have Jesus Christ living inside of you, if you have the right faith and you are in the will of God, you can heal somebody. But we're not operating like we can. We're not living like we can. We're not moving like we can. Are you praying like you can? Are you walking by problems with the thought that I could be the difference in that problem? Or are you walking by the problem going, well, I've never healed anybody before. I don't have the power to do anything in their circumstance. No, the power lives inside of you. You, you can make a difference, but you got to tap into the God that's living inside of you and stop thinking through your own mind and your own thoughts and you know the way that you see it and see it the way that God sees it, that all things are possible with Him. That's what He was teaching Peter, right? Yeah, you're going to fail on your own, but with me, it's possible. And so you just have to live with the faith that you believe it's possible. I'm telling you, watch out. We're going to start healing people up in here once we start believing in the God that lives inside of us. When we start praying with the faith that we need to have to make a difference. 
Number two, so we have to be, we have to be willing to get into people's life. Number two, you have to be aware of the people around you. And I want you to catch this because they might be hiding in plain sight. Uh, this is going to be really interesting because sometimes there's, there's people, I'll, I guarantee you, five of you walked into this building this morning and there was a bunch of us out there in the lobby going, oh, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? You went, I'm good. And you know that was a lie. You know you're not doing good. You know you had the worst week in the world and you know you're falling apart on the inside. But we put a, a mask on hiding the problems inside of us, lying to everyone about how great your life is when you know you're suffering on the inside. And so I'm just telling you, if that's happening here in the church within the Christians, how many people out there in the world are saying they're good when they know they're not? And they're hiding in plain sight. And so here's Jesus, and this is Luke 19. He's, he's walking through, and he, Jesus is always on the go. I don't, I don't know how Jesus does it. He's got energy because he's always moving. Right? He's always got somewhere to be. He's always got purpose, and he's always going through. And he's not stopping in Jericho. He's, got, he's walking through Jericho to somewhere else, and he's on the way. And there was a man, and his name was Zacchaeus. And he was a, a chief tax collector, someone that no Christian would be you know, caught with. right? Because we're better than the sinner. Because we got Jesus, right? No, we're not better. And, and so here's this guy that the Christians would have cut off. And the, the Bible tells him when he gets to the spot, when he approaches the spot, he stops what he's doing. He's on purpose, but he stops not for the crowd, but for the one. And he stops for the one because he knows that the one needs him. And so he stops and he looks up and he says, hey, come down. I need to go to your house. Oh, no, you don't, Jesus. Right? Because all the other Christians went, what is he doing hanging out with that guy? How could he dare go in there? That guy is a crook. He is somebody that you shouldn't be hanging out with. He is a sinner. Oh, no. Imagine a Christian humbling himself down to be with sinners. You were a sinner. You still are a sinner. You will always be a sinner, too. So it's okay. You know what I mean? And so here he is. But I love this because we get to the, the next verse. And it says that Jesus goes in there and, and And Zacchaeus just starts changing instantly, right? He's going, look, I'm going to give half of everything I have, everything I've gained. I'm going to give half of it to the poor. And then anybody I've wronged, I'm going to give it four times back. And Zacchaeus is, is, is changed instantly just by Jesus taking a moment with him. And so they go to his house and it actually says this in, in verse nine. Jesus responds, salvation has come to this home. Did you catch that? Jesus stops for one but a home is changed. You don't have to go save the world, but you can save one. You can have an impact on one, and you don't know what's going to happen. Zacchaeus didn't know his whole family was going to get saved. He just knew he wanted to see Jesus because he had something going on, and he didn't like the way he was living. But Jesus stopped for the one, and many were saved. Your influence goes beyond what you think, and you know that it's going to happen. Just like Jesus You have a spot in your life. And, you know, it's not always the spot that you know, but there's a spot in your life where you need to stop and see the person in front of you. There, there's going to be times and points of intersection that Jesus is going to put people that it, you may not know right away, but they are intersecting in your life in that moment, in that spot right now, because they need you. But more than they need you, they need the Jesus in you. And most of the time, the person you're helping is hiding, right? They're hiding right in front of you. It'd be really cool if you were walking down the frozen food section of H-E-B and you turn over and there's the dude and he's got a little neon sign flashing above him. This is the person. But it don't happen like that, right? Jesus ain't just highlighting who you're supposed to help. But I guarantee you, when you help them, you're going to know that God put them in your life. Because this is, this is what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to walk up to them and you're just going to say something simple. Like, excuse me, I'm trying to get to the peas. And they're going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry I was here. My whole life is falling. And they're just going to start going, right? And you're like, I'm just trying to get to the peas, man. You know, I don't know what's going on. But I, I just tell look, people are hiding in plain sight all the time, dying inside, waiting for you and for me and for all the other Christians just to, to take a moment. And you're, you're going like, I, I just, I, I can't see it. Let me tell you how you see it. You get in tune with God. 
When you wake up in the morning, you don't just go and get dressed. You don't just start your day. No, you get in tune with God. You start to pray without ceasing. You start inviting his presence into your life. You start, you start speaking to God, have your way in my life today. Whatever you want me to do, tell me to do. And, I'll, and you just invite him into the moment and into the day. Why? Because what you had yesterday isn't good enough for today. So you got to bring him back in. you got to make the choice every day to live for Jesus Christ. And so as you, as you invite him in and you, and you do that, you're going to run into the grocery store and you're not going to know why, but you're going to keep looking at that person. You're just kind of walking. You're going to look at him again. And man, I, everywhere I go, that person's in the same aisle as me. And, you know, it's going to be right in front of you. And finally, God's going to say, go say something to him. And if you're willing to submit to God, you're going to go up there and you're, you're going to speak and they're going to open up to you and you're not going to know what's going on. And some of you are going like, that's my worst nightmare. I don't know what to do. And I'm just telling you right now, if you are obedient to God, he will start speaking through you and moving through you, giving you words and stuff. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens. You get done, you walk away, and you're confused. You're like, I don't even know what I said. I don't even know what I did. I don't know. They're, they're crying. I'm crying. We're all crying. I don't know what happened. Why? Because the Spirit took over. It wasn't your words anymore. God will speak things into you for them that they didn't know was coming, you didn't know was coming. All you know is God had his way. But you got to be willing and you got to be open. You got to be aware because he's trying to move through you and you got to be ready to be moving with God. Here, here's the thing. We're all busy. I'm busy. You're busy. Who ain't busy? If you ain't busy, I got some stuff for you. OK, Look, we're all busy and it's easy to get caught up in life. Jesus could have easily been like, no, I'm not stopping in Jericho. I got somewhere to be. I'm on mission. I'm on purpose. They're waiting for me in Jerusalem. I got to go die on the cross. I don't have time for the one. Do you see the masses? It, it, he could have got caught up and nobody would have thought a thing, especially for a tax collector. But here's the thing. You don't know what the one's going to become. Let me tell you, do you think Billy Graham, in my memory, is the, the greatest evangelism you know, that was out there. He would hold these things and, and thousands and thousands would come to know. Do you know that the person that gave the gospel to Billy Graham probably didn't know that he was giving it to the, the Billy Graham that we know? You don't, you don't know the person you invest in, what they're going to become or what they're going to do. I mean, uh, imagine going up to heaven and being like, Chih, I say Billy Graham. Billy Graham may have saved a lot of people, but I say Billy Graham. You know what I mean? It's just like, I mean, we don't save them, but, you know, lead them to the gospel. Share Jesus with it. I'm just saying you don't know what the one's going to do. You don't know your influence. You, you know you can help one, but you don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Number three, and this is a tough one for us, and I, I know I'm going to hit some buttons on this one, but number three is you got to be willing to intermix and, and in multiple ways. Right, you got to be willing to intermix. And here's the thing, I get it, right? I get we have close friends, that we have friends that are so close that they are family, and I will never, ever, ever tell you to not hang out with those people or not to have that relationship with those people. But here's the thing you can't do. You can't close that circle off so tight that nobody else can get in, that you don't intermix with anybody else. Because let me tell you, once you close off that circle, you, you've lost your impact besides those four people. And more than likely, those four people are exactly the same as you. But you got to be willing to intermix, not just with other Christians, but with, oh, no, don't say it, unsaved people. Oh, no. We're Christian. We can't be hanging out with sinners and unsaved people. You better believe you can because we were called to be in the world, not of the world, but in the world. And if you're not in the world, if you have cut off everybody that, that does not know Jesus Christ out of your life, guess what you have done? You have closed off your influence to impact the kingdom. And so, yes, you got to help Christians. We got to have, look, there's my bestie, right? We're going to be besties, but we can have another person come in and be friends too. We can have another relationship. We can impact another life. And it's not that we have to stop being friends, but we got to let some people in. We got to allow some people to go. And I, I just wanted to share this story with you because Jesus finally takes a break. And this is in John 4. And he's, he's been going and he's made his all the way through Samaria. And he's going. And he's like, you know, I got to rest, guys. Y'all go on and go get some food. And I'm going to go sit down for a while because I'm tired. I've been preaching and healing and doing all these things. And so he goes down and he sits down at a well. 
and it's, it's about noon, and, and so this is the time that things happen. He goes and sits down, and, and guess what? A, a woman comes up, and he looks to this woman, and you don't talk to women, but here's the key about this. It's a Samaritan woman. Oh, Jews and, and, and Samaritans, they don't intermix. Why? Because the, the Jews are the chosen people, and the Samaritans are the, the, the unchosen, the heathens. And so we don't mix together. And so he looks to this, this lady that he's not even supposed to talk to, that shouldn't be near him, and he goes, hey, can, can you get me a drink? And she goes, why are you asking me? Why, why are you asking me for this? Don't you know that you're Jew and I'm Samaritan and we don't mix together? And Jesus' response to her was, if you only knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink from the, the living water, right? And, and it, he, he says, look, I know that there's people everywhere, but it's the one. And I'm willing to teach you in this moment. Why? Because she wasn't living her life right, and Jesus knew she wasn't living her life, life right. And there's people out there in your world that you know aren't living their life right. But you, you can't just go, oh, well, I can't intermix with them. They're on their own. They better figure it out. No, you got to be able to invite some people into your world. You got to invite some people. Jesus was very clear. You are to stay in the world, not be of the world. That means you don't lower your standard to the world, but you intermix and show people that there is light, that there is hope, that there is a better way, and the example to create the curiosity. And, and, and so Jesus does all this. All you got to do is hang out with some people. That's not so hard, right? You like to hang out with people. Everybody likes community. You got to hang out with some people that aren't exactly like you, that maybe not have the same values as you. It's not going to hurt you to love somebody. But you can have an impact on the kingdom. Jesus interacts with someone who doesn't even understand why he would interact with them. You want to talk about really blow someone's world open? Go sit down with somebody that would never even imagine you sitting down with them or, or even speaking to them or helping them. Or, I mean, when they don't even, they can't comprehend, guess what that's going to do? Why are you sitting here? And then you have the open door to go because Jesus Christ loves you. And he just, just walked right in that door. You're going to open it up and you're going to walk right through it. What an impact, what a breakthrough it would be through, through cultural boundaries and, and any other social boundaries or whatever, for us to be intermixed with the rest of the world making a difference. Are you open? Are you open? Are you willing? Are you aware? And are you open to be around people that need what you have? To remember that there was a day that you didn't have Jesus Christ, that you were lost, that you were a sinner, that you needed someone to come share the gospel with you and help you to overcome your life. Can we see past the reasons of separation? It's easy to make excuses, right? I can't hang out with Monica. She's got dye in her hair. Oh my, she don't even know what color her own hair is. You know what I mean? I could create whatever excuse I want to not hang out with, but can you look past any difference? that you may have with that person to go, I, I can help them. We, we may not agree on everything, but I, I can help them. And I can love them. And I can show them there's a different way. See, I, I just want to just level the playing field for a second. The, the world and culture has put out a message that is a giant lie. Here, here's the lie that they want you to believe. That you have to accept everything of the world to be able to show love. That is a lie. You do not have to compromise your belief system or your standard to love somebody. You can say, look, I will be here for you. I will love you. I will do anything for you. I'm just not going to participate in it as well. And you just show them the love of Jesus Christ in there. Jesus Christ was really good about going, hey, I got plenty of grace for you and I'm going to love you. But then I'm always going to give you the truth of what needs to happen and what, what needs to change. And so, you, yes. You can love anybody in any situation with the love of Jesus Christ without compromising yourself or your belief system. Don't buy into that lie. Don't buy into the labels that they would put on you. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. If you are pleasing God, you are on the right track. Here's, here's the last thing before we 
we wrap up. Giving someone your time speaks to them that they're valuable. If you want to really show someone that you care and you see value in them and, and that they're worth helping, you give them your time. Because it's, it's really hard for people to feel that if you're not going to invest in them. And I, I know that you hear everything I'm saying, but we, we got to put it into practice. And you're going, well, I'm, I'm willing to invest. And I'm willing to, to be aware. And I'm, I'm willing to do these things. Well, great. We have an awesome opportunity for you. Next Saturday, we're going to feed the homeless as a church. And you're invited. You're, you're invited to do this. And for a lot of us, the homeless is a group that we probably would view as untouchable. That we would walk by or drive by or not invest in or, or, or move. But that's not the love of God. And I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, from where I'm standing, I don't know what will happen. I can't guarantee anybody will come to know Jesus or that we will see a radical change or miracles or anything. But what I can tell you is that you are, if you are a willing vessel and you're willing to go in there and to be filled with the Spirit and submit to God and help people and love on them and not judge them, but just care for them, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what God can do down there. If, if someone says, hey, I need some prayer, and you pray with all the faith, you don't know that you don't heal somebody that day. You don't know that you don't change a life. You don't know that you don't share a testimony that moves through that place that changes life. But here's the thing. we got to be willing. we got to be aware. And we got to mix in. And so you have an opportunity to practice everything that we've been teaching and talking about, to go down there and to love some people that may just seem a little bit untouchable to you. And I'm not judging you. I'm just expressing there's opportunity. We have to love everybody no matter what. Why? Because God loved us. I mean, I'm just, I want to be honest for a minute. If I was God and I looked at as me, if I looked down on me, I would see someone that probably didn't deserve love. Some moments, Right? Someone that didn't deserve to be saved. But he didn't wait for me to get better before he loved me. No, he loved me in my current condition as a sinner. Loved me first and brought me up. And all he's saying is for you to do the same thing. To look past anything that would be a barrier or a hinder and say, I'm going to love some people and see what God can do. Why don't you stand with me? I hope you are floating on air knowing how valuable, how influential you are, that you don't need crowds, you don't need masses, you don't need titles, you don't need a stage, you don't need anything. All you need is Jesus, and all you need to do is be aware and willing and open, and you can impact the kingdom that we are trying to build. What a wonderful opportunity. How, how blessed are we that God would choose us you know, he could solve all the world's problems with a snap of a finger. He's that powerful. He could just end hunger. He could end homelessness. He could end whatever. With a snap of a finger, he could do it. But instead, he chose you and he chose me to be vessels to do his work. And what a privilege and honor that is. But we got to be doing it, though. we got to be doing it. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we just ask right now in this moment, Lord, bring that person to mind. Bring them to mind right now. That person that you are putting in that spot of our life, that person that you have placed in front of us to be willing to touch, Lord, to be willing to invest in, Lord, to, to be aware so that we can intermix with them and allow your spirit to move, Lord. And so we just thank you right now as you prepare us, that you give us strength, that we don't have to have all the right words and we don't have to have all the thoughts put together. But if we are just a willing vessel to get into the presence of the Lord and go before those people that you will speak on our behalf, that you will do all the work. All we have to do is just open up our lives to you, Lord. Lord, we believe in you. 
And we believe in the miracles that you can do. We believe in the power in the name of Jesus Christ, that there is victory, that you have overcome sickness and disease and death and sin. And so as we have you living and moving inside of us, we have the power to do the things that you have told us we can do. And so we believe in your victory, Lord Jesus. We believe that we have the answer to this world. And so, Lord, help us not to remove ourselves from this world, but to be in the world, but to set a standard inside of us that won't be compromised, that we will be able to stand firm in our beliefs, stand firm in our faith, and show that there is a light in this darkness, that we don't have to bow to the things that the world says, but that we can hold our standard and we can show them who you are through the love of Jesus Christ, and that you not only died for us as Christians, but you died for the whole world, Lord and that there is no one that is not below saving, that everybody has value, everybody has has a worth to them because you didn't die for the the chosen people, you died for all the people, Lord. And so we just thank you, Lord, as you continue to minister to us, that you transform us, that you make us into your image and likeness. And as we do that, Lord, we ask that you use us Use us for your glory. Use us for your name because we know that if we do anything good, Lord, it's because of you because all things that are good come from heaven, Lord Jesus. So we don't lift up ourselves and we don't magnify ourselves, Lord, but we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus. And you are the one that is worthy of the praise. All the glory goes to you, Lord. So we just say, use this church. Use all the people in here. Use us for your glory, Lord Jesus. What an honor and a privilege it is to be a part of your chosen people, Lord. We just give you the honor and the praise. In your name we pray. Amen, amen.